This is the NBC University Theater, presenting another in our series of radio plays based on the world's great stories. Tonight, The Purloined Letter by Edgar Allan Poe, starring Adolf Manjou. The tales of Edgar Allan Poe are largely a blend of the mysterious, the mystical, and the macabre, with the accent perhaps on the latter quality. And yet, when he wished, Poe could forget his intense preoccupation with the element of horror and tell a story of pure mystery in such absorbing fashion that he can truly be called the first great writer of modern detective fiction. Tonight we present Adolf Manjou as Detective Auguste Dupin, in the classic story of Parisian intrigue, The Purloined Letter, by Edgar Allan Poe. This is Edgar Allan Poe. The tale I wish to relate to you now is another instance of the work of my amazing friend, Monsieur Auguste Dupin. You will, I have no doubt, remember Dupin as the man who solved the grisly murders in the Rue Morgue and that of Marie Roger. I will spare you tonight any such further instance of tragic death. But even in this case of which I speak now, I cannot but feel that the solution at which Dupin arrived would have been beyond the powers of any other man I have ever known. But to begin the tale at what seems the logical place... My dear Poe, would you mind uh, stirring up the fire a bit? Not at all. Uh, this autumn weather gets into one's bones. Ah, that is better. Also, it gives me more light to enjoy the smoke of my pipe. We could light the lamp. But you always say you think better in the dark. Well, light it if you like, by all means. I think we may be having a visitor soon. And besides, why do you suppose... Your guess was right about the visitor. Who is it? Well, I imagine it is Monsieur le Prefet. He has not been here for a month. It would take him that long to make up his mind to appeal to me again. And that's why you should be thinking. This affair of the purloined letter, it's completely baffling. You think so? Don't you? I'm sure Her Highness the Princess wouldn't share your calmness. Nor will Monsieur le Prefet. We shall see. Ah, good evening, Garon. Yeah. Good evening, Dupin. Monsieur Paul. Good evening, Monsieur le Prefet. Sit down, Garon, sit down. Uh, we haven't seen you here late. Have you uh, come on special business? Why, no, nothing in particular. Well, well, we shall have a nice chat. Everything going well with our gallant officers of the police? Uh, quite well. But, Monsieur Garon, what of the letter? Have you found it? Ah, oh, Monsieur Poe, you force me to speak. I am a tormented man. I am quite at the end of my own. No success yet. None. And my reputation, I shall lose my office if I fail. There was also a large reward, I believe you said. Tremendous. I would be rich, but I shall never get it. I am not so sure, Garon. I think you might. No, 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 no. I have done everything. I shall be ruined. Tell me, Dupin, what shall I do? Do? <laughs> Why, take advice, to be sure. Well, I assure you, Dupin, I am perfectly willing to take advice and pay for it. I would give 50,000 francs to the man who could help me. 50,000, eh? My personal check. Well, then, uh, let us consider. We will take this case back to its very beginning and examine it. It began, we will recall the princess. <laughs> a letter, Your Highness. It has just been brought by messenger. Thank you, Marie. Who is it? Oh, uh, Marie, uh, will you uh, will you go into the wardrobe and find my other dancing slippers? These pain me. At once, Your Highness. I bring them right away. My most dearly beloved, I am here at my estate, knowing that it is wisest, but I am as one in exile. Every moment I spend away from you is an aeon spent in purgatory. Why does he write this way? It is too dangerous. I remember so clearly the look in your eyes on the day I left the court. Perhaps Philippe and Leon. 
Yes, my dear wife. Uh, has something happened to upset you? Why, 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 no, no, only you startled me. As I predicted, Your Highness, the princess is not yet ready. Perhaps we might have a few more words. There is nothing more to be said, De Leon. I shall never agree to this tax you propose. It is robbery. Uh, Louise, make haste. You know how you had to miss the first dance at the ball. Uh, what was that you were reading as we came in? Nothing. It's uh, it's uh, only an, an unimportant letter from some nobody in the provinces. Oh, well, then put it down and make ready. Yes, yes, of course. Ah, I perceive that our princess will be once again the loveliest lady at the ball. You are too flattering, Comte de Leon. Not at all. Your Highness must pardon my intrusion into your boudoir, but I was in the middle of a discussion with your honored husband. Apologies do not sound well from you, Monsieur le Comte. In my humble position as Minister of Finance... In your humble position as Minister of Finance, De Leon, you contrive never to give me a moment's peace. But since your Highness opposes me on every measure... Enough of that, De Leon. You will handle the matter exactly as I have ordered. Very well, then. I will make a memorandum to that effect, lest I forget. Uh, by the way, Your Highness, uh, you will not mind if I scribble it on the back of this uh, piece of uh, waste paper from the table? Monsieur le Comte. Oh, a thousand pardons. I thought you said the note was worthless. It is, it is perhaps uh, something Your Highness wishes to treasure? Why, 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 no, no, of course not. Ah, good. I... Well, au revoir. I trust we shall meet again at the ball. Your Highness is enjoying the party? And why should I not be? That is for Your Highness to know. De Leon, I demand that you return to me that letter. Letter? What can Your Highness mean? The letter you stole from my boudoir an hour ago. Oh, that letter... Au contraire, Your Highness, I shall treasure it. In future, you might suggest to a certain gentleman that he learn to disguise his hand when addressing such missives. One has eyes, after all. I shall accuse you to my husband as a thief. I doubt it. You could have done so in the boudoir, while His Highness stood right there. Ah, no, Your Highness, you must not call me a thief. That is an ugly name for a man who merely watches his opportunity. Opportunity of what? It is possible that your husband's mind might be changed in the matter of this new tax. He will never agree to it. I say he might, if you were to suggest it to him. Your scheme will fail. My husband knows that I feel as he does in these matters. He will know that something is wrong. Something. But he will not know what. It would be a pity for all parties should he find out, n'est-ce pas? It was nearly a year thereafter, Monsieur le Préfet, that you honored me with your first call. Monsieur Poe and I had been sitting here talking of political events, the significance of which we did not at the time understand. You arrived and told us of the purloined letter. The business, as you see, is very simple, and I've no doubt we can manage it ourselves. But I thought you and Monsieur Paul might well like to hear of it, Dupin, since it is so very odd. Simple and odd? Uh, why, yes. In fact, we've been puzzled because the whole thing is so simple. And yet, it baffles us. And the reward offered is prodigious. Perhaps the whole thing is a little too plain. <laughs> you and your strange notions, Dupin. But now to the matter. It is clear that the letter is still in De Leon's possession. How do you know that? Well, if he had used it or disclosed its contents, he would no longer have his power over the royal personage whose honor he threatens. Poe and I were just speaking of the rapid ascendancy of De Leon's faction in the court. This explains it. You proceeded, then, on the assumption that the minister still has the letter. Precisely. Now, for the last three months, the minister has often been away from home all night. In that time, my men and I have completely ransacked his home. It is impossible that we should have missed it. He could not, I suppose, be carrying it with him. Out of the question. 
we have posed as robbers and waylaid him twice to search him. Well, he must have expected that. What was the appearance of this letter? Oh, an ordinary one. Except, of course, for the small red crest embossed on it. Folded twice over, the address in a large, bold, masculine hand, the paper heavy. Very good. Tell me, Garam, how have you gone about searching the house? Well, we took our time. We looked everywhere. We searched the drawers. To us, of course, there is no such thing as a secret drawer. We probed the cushions with needles, took the tops from the tables. Why? Why that? It is possible, Monsieur Poe. To bore a hole in a table leg or the top of a bedpost and hide something inside. But the legs of the chairs, you didn't take all the chairs apart. We did better. We examined the jointings of every piece of furniture with a microscope. The smallest bit of gimlet dust would have looked as large as an apple. You looked behind the mirrors, of course. Look, the mirrors, the carpets, the paper on the walls, the binding of the books, everything. Then you're making a mistake. The letter is not on the premises. He has sent it away. Uh, I fear you may be right. Nonsense. Of course it is there. He would have to be able to produce it at a moment's notice. But, Dupin, what shall I do? Look again. That is perfectly useless. It is the only advice I have to give you. Uh, very well, then. I'll go again tonight. And you, too, shall come along. Take Monsieur Poe if you wish. But I fear the minister has placed the letter not merely out of sight, but out of mind. I shall search for it in my own mind right here. Now, Monsieur Poe, the servants sleep at a distance, but we must take no chances. Of course, of course. The library is here. Is that you, Jacques? Oui, Monsieur le Préfet. Find anything new? Some few parcels, Monsieur. I was just coming to them. Well, get about it. Oui, Monsieur le Préfet. Come, Monsieur Poe, you and I, we shall re-examine the pages of the larger books on these shelves. Mm. Well, let's begin that. Can't you open that lantern another inch? Impossible. We must have secrecy. Besides, could you not see a letter if it were lying in a book? I should like to be able to look around. One does not need to see to search. Jacques, the parcels. Nothing in the first, Monsieur le Préfet. Ah, your men are indeed skillful. I had forgotten there was anyone in the room but ourselves. Oh, look out. These, Monsieur Beau, I beg of you to be careful. Ah, I'm so sorry. The book slipped out of my hand. Again, I must remind you how important it is that no one realize we are here. That's strange. What is it? This book I just dropped. It's a book of his own verses. Whose own verses? The Comte de Leon. I didn't know he was a poet. Well, the Comte de Leon is a fool. What makes you say that? And what is a poet if not a fool? I tell you, if de Leon were really clever, I should have had him a long time ago. It must be through sheer idiocy that he escapes me. The devil take him and his foolish verses. <laughs> <laughs> so Garant pronounced all poet fools, eh? I might well be offended at that if I chose. I regard my own poetry as being quite as good as de Leon's. The poetry surprised me, frankly. Somehow I'd always had the impression that de Leon had written a learned text on uh, differential calculus, that he was known as a mathematician, not a poet. I suppose he has a brother who is the mathematician. You are mistaken. De Leon is both. Both poet and mathematician. A very versatile mind. But I'm really puzzled, Dupin. If Garon and his men really searched the whole place the way we did that room last night... I assure isn't... you that they did. But they have considered only their own ideas of ingenuity. How do you mean? I mean that all this boring and probing and looking through microscopes is only an exaggeration of their usual tactics. Our friend Garon has the mind of a mathematician himself. And this mind naturally considers the minister a fool because he is renowned as a poet. Then he must think the same of you. <laughs> Perhaps my doggerel has not come to Garant's attention, which reminds me. Will you walk with me to the bookseller at the corner? There's a little book of verse I have been meaning to get. The next corner? There's no bookseller there. My dear Poe, are you totally blind? The sign over his shop fills half the street. Look for yourself. Oh, that's odd. I must have passed along here a dozen times and never noticed that sign. Of course I'll walk with you. Hello, hello, what is this? Children. Oh, they seem to be after that small boy. Why, this is the small son of my concierge, Pierre. 
Pierre, come here. Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul, make them go now, away. Now, come now, Pierre. They'll not hurt you. But they call me a thief because I have all their marbles. Have you stolen them? But of course not. It is a game, monsieur. One holds marbles in his hand, the other guesses whether the number of marbles is even or odd. If you are right, you win one. If you are wrong, you lose one. And you won all your friends' marbles at this game? Oui, monsieur. And now they say I cheat. I do not see how it would be possible to cheat. But you must have some principle of guessing. Yes, there is a way. I have only to know how clever the other boy is. Uh Aha. Perhaps the first time I guess odd and lose. If he is very stupid, he thinks I will change my second guess to even. But I guess odd again, and of course I win. What if the other boy is not such a simpleton? Then he will start to change from even to odd. But he will realize that this is too simple a move to fool me. And so he remains even. Excellent. You know, I should like to test this theory. I have some coins here. Let us assume we have already played this game once, and the coins I held the first time ran even longer. Well... What do I hold now? Come, come, why don't you make your guess? I do not know you, monsieur. You must tell me first how clever you are. (laughs) I assure you, Pierre, Monsieur Dupin is the cleverest man in the world. You exaggerate somewhat, Pooh. But come, Pierre, what do I hold now? An odd number, monsieur. Well, Dupin? Your record is unbroken, Pierre. How did you guess? Monsieur Pope said you were very clever. Therefore, you would try to fool me by doing exactly what a very stupid boy would do. By simply changing from even to odd. You see, it's easy. Mm, As you say, Pierre, as you say, it is easy. Look here. Take these three francs and buy more marbles for your friends. It will put you back in their good graces. Run along now. Oh, merci, monsieur, merci. Au revoir, monsieur. Now, there is a child who does just what Garant cannot do. He thinks not of how he would do a thing, but of how his opponent would do it. Well, that's all very well, but what if you fail to measure your opponent's intellect correctly? Ah, that is exactly the point. Garant begins with the assumption that De Leon is merely a poet and therefore a fool. Whereas, we know that the minister is both poet and a mathematician. Consider now, as a mathematician, he understands the mathematical mind of our friend Garant. But as a poet, De Leon would have enough imagination to hide it somewhere else. But where and how? Well, perhaps he has concealed it by not concealing it at all, by making it so obvious that... Monsieur Po, wait. You have walked right under the bookseller's sign without seeing it again. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, then, suppose we go in, Dupin. Well, never mind the bookseller. I must leave you now. But I thought... Uh, Have you... you a pair of dark spectacles? Dark spectacles? Yes. Here you are. Excellent. And now, mon ami, farewell. But where are you going? I have just recalled a most urgent appointment. I am going to play marbles, Monsieur Pou, with the Minister of Finance. Well, Dupin, welcome, welcome. Sit down, won't you? Ah, good morning, Monsieur de Leon. I'll just sit over here by the fire, if you do not mind. Will you have coffee? No, thank you, no. I breakfasted some time ago. Ah, how I envy you men of energy who rise early. For myself, I think I was lazy in my cradle. One would of necessity get up ahead of you in the morning, eh, de Leon? (laughs) Still a wit, I see, Dupin. But to what do I owe the honor of your visit? Why, to nothing. I was merely passing by. Well, I am delighted to chat with you. Tell me, how does the world treat you? I trust those dark spectacles are not evidence of any difficulty? No, 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 merely fatigue. I find they enable me to see more clearly. As you know, that is important in my profession. Ah, quite, quite. Yes, it seems to me I have heard of your clever work in connection with some rather uh, notorious murders. I was perhaps able to help. (laughs) It it must have been a relief to our friend, Monsieur le Préfet, helping you to do his thinking for him. A pity you have never been given a place at court. Such cleverness as yours would do well. Well, I consider one clever fellow to be quite enough for any court. If that is a compliment, it is too incorrect to be clear. Uh, do you care for snuff? No, no, thank you. I have my own snuff box right here. Ah, excellent snuff. I recommend the brands. I am unfortunately a creature of habit. I have always used the same brand. 
Uh, charming library you have here, De Leon. Are you as ardent a collector as ever? I pride myself that no man in France has a better collection of verse and manuscript. Have you ever seen my original of Crébillon's après? I uh, must be under the pain of reminding you how you snatched uh, that manuscript out from under my nose, uh, just as I was preparing to add it to my own collection. <laughs> my apologies. I'm afraid the auctioneer was a personal friend of mine. Friend of mine, I thought. Uh, your friendship, it seems, was worth more to him. Ah, uh, well, I shall repay you one day. <laughs> I shall be on the lookout. Uh, are you sure you will not take some refreshment? Quite sure. I am leaving directly. It has been a pleasure to see you, Dupin. I trust you will come soon again. It is always an honor to entertain a fellow poet and an old friend. Dupin. Dupin! You've been sitting with that pile of writing paper for an hour. What on earth are you doing? Merely amusing myself, my dear Paul. I wish your amusement didn't call for the burning of so much sealing wax. I'm quite stifled with the odor. I shall be finished directly. No, by the by. If you are not occupied tomorrow, mon ami, I wish you would stop by the minister with me. I must return there. This morning, by the merest accident, I left a gold snuffbox on his library table. My dear Dupin, I am delighted that you took me so promptly at my work. Most ridiculously careless of me, De Leon. I seem to have left my snuff box with you yesterday. Well, yes, of course. It is here on the table. Oh, this is my friend, Monsieur Poe of the United States, uh, Le Comte De Leon. A pleasure, Your Excellency. Ah, an American. I trust you are finding Dupin a satisfactory guide to the sights of our capital? A most superior guide, monsieur. It is fortunate that you returned, Dupin. I should like your opinion on a folio I have purchased. It was delivered this morning. I should be delighted to look at it. It is there on the desk. I am assured that it is unquestionably... Listen. What's happening? Upon my word, there seems to be some disturbance in the street. Those were shots. I don't understand. Open the window, monsieur. Let's see what it is. Indeed, yes. There. There. That man. He has a pistol. He's firing into the crowd. Why don't some of the men seize him? Ah, discretion, monsieur Po. The fellow is obviously a lunatic. Ah, ah, ah. The gendarmes are coming at yes. last. Yes. Yes, they've got him. What a peculiar thing. Ah, they're taking him off now. Dupin, what do you make of it? Uh, what is it? Is the excitement over? Well, you're a cool fellow. You mean you haven't moved from that desk through all of this? I was absorbed in this manuscript. Also, it pains me to look upon disorder. Well, and what do you think of my acquisition? Well, most interesting. I must beg your leave to come again and examine it more at leisure. Come, my dear Paul, we shall be going before any more shooting starts. Yes, of course. Delighted to have made your acquaintance, Comte de Leon. And yours, monsieur? Au revoir, de Leon. Au revoir, monsieur. Uh, Dupin, a moment. What is it? Regardez, mon ami. You have once again forgotten your snuff box. I am desperate. You have accomplished nothing by these visits to the land. Softly, softly. You recall my saying, my dear Poe, that our friend Garant here would surely have found the letter had the minister's reasoning been anything like his own. But you know I did everything. My reputation is at stake. One moment, monsieur. I was convinced that De Leon would reason quite differently. After the fashion of the child Pierre with his marble. Please, Dupin, this is serious. Assuredly. Uh, and so de Leon had to find a method of concealment that would not occur to Monsieur le Préfet. And it was you, my dear Po, who convinced me that de Leon had concealed the letter by the very artistic means of not concealing it at all. You mean the bookseller sign? Exactly. It was right under your nose, and for that very reason, completely escaped your eyes. But how did you... Under cover of your spectacles, I let my eyes wander about the room. And just under the mantelpiece, I saw hanging a cheap little pasteboard rack 
of the sort one puts visiting cards into. Did you happen to notice it, Garon? Eh? Why, uh, why, uh, no. Not that I remember. Just so. And for that, I must remind you of the 50,000 francs you spoke of a while ago. Here is a check. Would you mind filling it out for that amount? What is this? I cannot see that well, you... Well, have... there is much that you cannot see, Garon. This rack I spoke of, in it with several cards, was a letter of most conspicuous unimportance. I am not interested in unimportant letters. And the minister knew it. This letter bore a large black seal instead of the small red one you described. The handwriting was feminine instead of large and bold. In short, it was so completely different that I was convinced it was the very same. What? What's that you say? Have you written that check yet, uh, Garon? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Here it is. Mm. 50,000 francs. Mm, thank you. And here is the purloined letter. Mon Dieu! It is the letter! This is unbelievable! I shall be rich! Well, uh, control yourself, Garon. Control yourself. The next day, my dear Poe, when you and I returned to the ministers under the pretext of retrieving my snuff box, I had the dummy letter you saw me making. While that disturbance was going on in the street, I made the change. It was lucky for you that the lunatic came along when he did. Quite so, huh? By the by, Garon, I believe you are still holding that fellow. Mm. I wish you would let him go. I cannot go about without a valet. Your valet? You mean that lunatic is your valet? <laughs> You use your eyes even less than I had supposed, my dear Garon. You have seen Barty twenty times. You could at least have recognized him under the circumstances. Oh, uh, uh, gentlemen, I, I seem to be feeling a little indisposed. And I must return the letter to the owner at once. Uh, you will pardon me. Uh, au revoir, monsieur. Au revoir. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad fellow, Philippe. So much for the purloined letter. But listen, Dupin... Very likely De Leon doesn't yet know it's gone. That was my object. A pity I will never know his thoughts, though, when he is reduced to opening the false letter I left in its place. Why? Did you put anything in it? Why, it would have been insulting to leave it blank. He has read the Greeks, I know. We have often discussed them. So I just wrote, by way of signature, the line from Aristophanes, an eager, meager servant of the muse. We poets, mon ami... We understand each other at the last. The curtain of the NBC University Theater falls on another in our series of radio plays based on the world's great stories. Tonight's adaptation of the Edgar Allan Poe story, The Purloined Letter, was written by Clarice A. Ross and starred Adolf Manjou in the role of Auguste Dupin, with John Newland as Poe, David Wolfe as Garand, and Theodore von Else as De Leon. Adolf Manjou may soon be seen in the Warner Brothers picture, My Dream is Yours. Others in tonight's cast were Howard Jeffrey, Alma Lawton, Bill Shaw, Byron Kane, Francis Pascoe, and John Ramsey Hill. We invite you to listen again next week when the NBC University Theater will present Gulliver's Travels, a radio play based on the famous stories by Jonathan Swift, starring Henry Hull. <laughs> Tonight's production of The Purloined Letter was under the direction of Max Hutto. Original music was composed by Albert Harris and conducted by Henry Russell. Productions of the NBC University Theater are currently being used in conjunction with a course in American and British fiction under a college by radio plan at the University of Louisville. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.